doing, and so you are not surprised. But presently he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably, and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. The command, Be ye perfect, is not idealistic gas, nor is it a command to do the impossible. He is going to make us into creatures that can obey that command. He said in the Bible that we were gods, and he is going to make good his words. If we let him, for we can prevent him if we choose, he will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a god or goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine, a bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long and in parts very painful, but that is what we are in for, nothing less. He meant what he said. Chapter 10 Nice People or New Men He meant what he said. Those who put themselves in his hands will become perfect, as he is perfect. Perfect in love, wisdom, joy, beauty, and immortality. The change will not be completed in this life, for death is an important part of the treatment. How far the change will have gone before death in any particular Christian is uncertain. I think this is the right moment to consider a question which is often asked. If Christianity is true, why are not all Christians obviously nicer than all non-Christians? What lies behind that question is partly something very reasonable and partly something that is not reasonable at all. The reasonable part is this. If conversion to Christianity makes no improvement in a man's outward actions, if he continues to be just as snobbish or spiteful or envious or ambitious as he was before, then I think we must suspect that his conversion was largely imaginary. And after one's original conversion, every time one thinks one has made an advance, that is the test to apply. Fine feelings, new insights, greater interest in religion mean nothing unless they make our actual behavior better. Just as in an illness, feeling better is not much good if the thermometer shows that your temperature is still going up. In that sense, the outer world is quite right to judge Christianity by its results. Christ told us to judge by results. A tree is known by its fruit, or, as we say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. When we Christians behave badly or fail to behave well, we are making Christianity unbelievable to the outside world. The wartime posters told us that careless talk costs lives. It is equally true that careless lives cost talk. Our careless lives set the outer world talking, and we give them grounds for talking in a way that throws doubt on the truth of Christianity itself. But there is another way of demanding results in which the outer world may be quite illogical. They may demand not merely that each man's life should improve if he becomes a Christian, they may also demand, before they believe in Christianity, that they should see the whole world neatly divided into two camps, Christian and non-Christian and that all the people in the first camp at any given moment should be obviously nicer than all the people in the second. This is unreasonable on several grounds. 1. In the first place, the situation in the actual world is much more complicated than that. The world does not consist of 100% Christians and 100% non-Christians. There are people, a great many of them, who are ceasing to be Christians, but who still call themselves by that name. Some of them are clergymen. There are other people who are slowly becoming Christians, though they do not yet call themselves so. There are people who do not accept the full Christian doctrine about Christ, but who are so strongly attracted by him that they are his in a much deeper sense than they themselves understand. There are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity, and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it. For example, a Buddhist of good will may be led to concentrate more and more on the Buddhist teaching about mercy, and to leave in the background, though he might still say he believed, the Buddhist teaching on certain other points. Many of the good pagans long before Christ's birth may have been in this position. And always, of course, there are a great many people who are just confused in mind, and have a lot of inconsistent beliefs all jumbled up together. Consequently, it is not much use trying to make judgments about Christians and non-Christians in the Mass. It is some use comparing cats and dogs, or even men and women in the mass, 
because there one knows definitely which is which. Also, an animal does not turn, either slowly or suddenly, from a dog into a cat. But when we are comparing Christians in general with non-Christians in general, we are usually not thinking about real people whom we know at all, but only about two vague ideas which we have got from novels and newspapers. If you want to compare the bad Christian and the good atheist, you must think about two real specimens whom you have actually met. Unless we come down to brass tacks in that way, we shall only be wasting time. 2. Suppose we have come down to brass tacks, and are now talking not about an imaginary Christian and an imaginary non-Christian, but about two real people in our own neighborhood. Even then we must be careful to ask the right question. If Christianity is true, then it ought to follow a. that any Christian will be nicer than the same person would be if he were not a Christian, b. that any man who becomes a Christian will be nicer than he was before. Just in the same way, if the advertisements of White Smiles toothpaste are true, it ought to follow a. that anyone who uses it will have better teeth than the same person would have if he did not use it, b. that if anyone begins to use it, his teeth will improve. But to point out that I, who use white smiles, and also have inherited bad teeth from both my parents, have not got as fine a set as some healthy young negro who never used toothpaste at all, does not, by itself, prove that the advertisements are untrue. Christian Miss Bates may have an unkinder tongue than unbelieving Dick Firkin. That, by itself, does not tell us whether Christianity works. The question is what Miss Bates' tongue would be like if she were not a Christian, and what Dick's would be like if he became one. Miss Bates and Dick, as a result of natural causes and early upbringing, have certain temperaments. Christianity professes to put both temperaments under new management if they will allow it to do so. What you have a right to ask is whether that management, if allowed to take over, improves the concern. Everyone knows that what is being managed in Dick Firkin's case is much nicer than what is being managed in Miss Bates's. That is not the point. To judge the management of a factory, you must consider not only the output, but the plant. Considering the plant at factory A, it may be a wonder that it turns out anything at all. Considering the first-class outfit at factory B, its output, though high, may be a great deal lower than it ought to be. No doubt the good manager at factory A is going to put in new machinery as soon as he can, but that takes time. In the meantime, low output does not prove that he is a failure. 3. And now, let us go a little deeper. The manager is going to put in new machinery. Before Christ has finished with Miss Bates, she is going to be very nice indeed. But if we left it at that, it would sound as though Christ's only aim was to pull Miss Bates up to the same level on which Dick had been all along. We have been talking, in fact, as if Dick were all right, as if Christianity was something nasty people needed and nice ones could afford to do without, and as if niceness was all that God demanded. But this would be a fatal mistake. The truth is that in God's eyes, Dick Firkin needs saving every bit as much as Miss Bates. In one sense, I will explain what sense in a moment, niceness hardly comes into the question. You cannot expect God to look at Dick's placid temper and friendly disposition exactly as we do. They result from natural causes which God himself creates. Being merely temperamental, they will all disappear if Dick's digestion alters. The niceness, in fact, is God's gift to Dick, not Dick's gift to God. In the same way, God has allowed natural causes, working in a world spoiled by centuries of sin, to produce in Miss Bates the narrow mind and jangled nerves which account for most of her nastiness. He intends, in his own good time, to set that part of her right. But that is not, for God, the critical part of the business. It presents no difficulties. It is not what he is anxious about. What he is watching and waiting and working for is something that is not easy even for God because, from the nature of the case, even he cannot produce it by a mere act of power. He is waiting and watching for it, both in Miss Bates and in Dick Firkin. It is something they can freely give him or freely refuse to him. Will they or will they not turn to him and thus fulfill the only purpose for which they were created? Their free will is trembling inside them like the needle of a compass. But this is a needle that can choose. It can point to its true north, but it need not. Will the needle swing round and settle and point to God? He can help it to do so. He cannot force it. He cannot, so to speak, put out his own hand and pull it into the right position, for then it would not be free will any more. Will it point north? That is the question on which all hangs. Will Miss Bates and Dick offer their natures to God? The question whether the natures they offer or withhold are at that moment nice or nasty ones is of secondary importance. 
God can see to that part of the problem. Do not misunderstand me. Of course, God regards a nasty nature as a bad and deplorable thing. And, of course, he regards a nice nature as a good thing, good like bread or sunshine or water. But these are the good things which he gives and we receive. He created Dick's sound nerves and good digestion, and there is plenty more where they came from. It costs God nothing, so far as we know, to create nice things. But to convert rebellious wills costs him crucifixion. And because they are wills, they can, in nice people just as much as in nasty ones, refuse his request. And then, because that niceness in Dick was merely part of nature, it will all go to pieces in the end. Nature herself will all pass away. Natural causes come together in Dick to make a pleasant psychological pattern just as they come together in a sunset to make a pleasant pattern of colours. Presently, for that is how nature works, they will fall apart again, and the pattern in both cases will disappear. Dick has had the chance to turn, or rather to allow God to turn, that momentary pattern into the beauty of an eternal spirit, and he has not taken it. There is a paradox here. As long as Dick does not turn to God, he thinks his niceness is his own, and just as long as he thinks that, it is not his own. It is when Dick realizes that his niceness is not his own but a gift from God, and when he offers it back to God, it is just then that it begins to be really his own. For now Dick is beginning to take a share in his own creation. The only things we can keep are the things we freely give to God. What we try to keep for ourselves is just what we are sure to lose. We must, therefore, not be surprised if we find among the Christians some people who are still nasty. There is even, when you come to think it over, a reason why nasty people might be expected to turn to Christ in greater numbers than nice ones. That was what people objected to about Christ during his life on earth. He seemed to attract such awful people. That is what people still object to, and always will. Do you not see why? Christ said, Blessed are the poor, and how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom, and no doubt he primarily meant the economically rich and economically poor. But do not his words also apply to another kind of riches and poverty? One of the dangers of having a lot of money is that you may be quite satisfied with the kinds of happiness money can give, and so fail to realize your need for God. If everything seems to come simply by signing checks, you may forget that you are at every moment totally dependent on God. Now, quite plainly, natural gifts carry with them a similar danger. If you have sound nerves and intelligence and health and popularity and a good upbringing, you are likely to be quite satisfied with your character as it is. Why drag God into it, you may ask? A certain level of good conduct comes fairly easily to you. You are not one of those wretched creatures who are always being tripped up by sex or dipsomania or nervousness or bad temper. Everyone says you are a nice chap and, between ourselves, you agree with them. You are quite likely to believe that all this niceness is your own doing and you may easily not feel the need for any better kind of goodness. Often people who have all these natural kinds of goodness cannot be brought to recognize their need for Christ at all until, one day, the natural goodness lets them down, and their self-satisfaction is shattered. In other words, it is hard for those who are rich in this sense to enter the kingdom. It is very different for the nasty people the little, low, timid, warped, thin-blooded, lonely people, or the passionate, sensual, unbalanced people. If they make any attempt at goodness at all, they learn, in double-quick time, that they need help. It is Christ or nothing for them. It is taking up the cross and following, or else despair. They are the lost sheep. He came specially to find them. They are, in one very real and terrible sense, the poor. He blessed them. They are the awful set he goes about with, and, of course, the Pharisees say still, as they said from the first, if there were anything in Christianity, those people would not be Christians. There is either a warning or an encouragement here for every one of us. If you are a nice person, if virtue comes easily to you, beware. Much is expected from those to whom much is given. If you mistake for your own merits what are really God's gifts to you through nature, and if you are contented with simply being nice, you are still a rebel, and all those gifts will only make your fall more terrible your corruption more complicated, your bad example more disastrous. The devil was an archangel once. His natural gifts were as far above yours as yours are above those of a chimpanzee. But if you are a poor creature, poisoned by a wretched upbringing in some house full of vulgar jealousies and senseless quarrels, saddled by no choice of your own with some loathsome sexual perversion, 
nagged day in and out by an inferiority complex that makes you snap at your best friends, do not despair. He knows all about it. You are one of the poor whom he blessed. He knows what a wretched machine you are trying to drive. Keep on. Do what you can. One day, perhaps in another world, but perhaps far sooner than that, he will fling it on the scrap heap and give you a new one. And then you may astonish us all, not least yourself. For you have learned your driving in a hard school. Some of the last will be first, and some of the first will be last. Niceness, wholesome, integrated personality, is an excellent thing. We must try by every medical, educational, economic and political means in our power to produce a world where as many people as possible grow up nice, just as we must try to produce a world where all have plenty to eat. But we must not suppose that even if we succeeded in making everyone nice, we should have saved their souls. A world of nice people, content in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world, and might even be more difficult to save. For mere improvement is not redemption, though redemption always improves people even here and now, and will, in the end, improve them to a degree we cannot yet imagine. God became man to turn creatures into sons, not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. It is not like teaching a horse to jump better and better, but like turning a horse into a winged creature. Of course, once it has got its wings, it will soar over fences which could never have been jumped, and thus beat the natural horse at its own game. But there may be a period, while the wings are just beginning to grow, when it cannot do so. And at that stage, the lumps on the shoulders, no one could tell by looking at them that they are going to be wings, may even give it an awkward appearance. But perhaps we have already spent too long on this question. If what you want is an argument against Christianity, and I will remember how eagerly I looked for such arguments when I began to be afraid it was true, you can easily find some stupid and unsatisfactory Christian and say, So there's your boasted new man. Give me the old kind. But if once you have begun to see that Christianity is on other grounds probable, you will know in your heart that this is only evading the issue. What can you ever really know of other people's souls, of their temptations, their opportunities, their struggles? One soul in the whole creation you do know, and it is the only one whose fate is placed in your hands. If there is a God, you are, in a sense, alone with him. You cannot put him off with speculations about your next-door neighbors or memories of what you have read in books. What will all that chatter and hearsay count? Will you even be able to remember it when the anesthetic fog which we call nature or the real world fades away and the presence in which you have always stood becomes palpable, immediate, and unavoidable? Chapter 11, The Last Chapter The New Men In the last chapter I compared Christ's work of making new men to the process of turning a horse into a winged creature. I used that extreme example in order to emphasize the point that it is not mere improvement, but transformation. The nearest parallel to it in the world of nature is to be found in the remarkable transformations we can make in insects by applying certain rays to them. Some people think this is how evolution worked. The alterations in creatures on which it all depends may have been produced by rays coming from outer space. Of course, once the alterations are there, what they call natural selection gets to work on them, i.e., the useful alterations survive and the other ones get weeded out. Perhaps a modern man can understand the Christian idea best if he takes it in connection with evolution. Everyone now knows about evolution, though of course some educated people disbelieve it. Everyone has been told that man has evolved from lower types of life. Consequently, people often wonder, what is the next step? When is the thing beyond man going to appear? Imaginative writers try sometimes to picture this next step, the superman as they call him, but they usually only succeed in picturing someone a good deal nastier than man as we know him, and then try to make up for that by sticking on extra legs or arms. But supposing the next step was to be something even more different from the earlier steps than they ever dreamed of. And is it not very likely it would be? Thousands of centuries ago, huge, very heavily armored creatures were evolved. If anyone had at that time been watching the course of evolution, he would probably have expected that it was going to go on to heavier and heavier armor. But he would have been wrong. The future had a card up its sleeve which nothing at that time would have led him to expect. It was going to spring on him little, naked, unarmored animals which had better brains and with those brains they were going to master the whole planet. They were not merely going to have more power than the prehistoric monsters, they were going to have a new kind of power. 
The next step was not only going to be different, but different with a new kind of difference. The stream of evolution was not going to flow on in the direction in which he saw it flowing. It was, in fact, going to take a sharp bend. Now, it seems to me that most of the popular guesses at the next step are making just the same sort of mistake. People see, or at any rate they think they see, men developing greater brains and getting greater mastery over nature. And because they think the stream is flowing in that direction, they imagine it will go on flowing in that direction. But I cannot help thinking that the next step will be really new. It will go off in a direction you could never have dreamed of. It would hardly be worth calling a new step unless it did. I should expect not merely difference, but a new kind of difference. I should expect not merely change, but a new method of producing the change. Or, to make an Irish bull, I should expect the next stage in evolution not to be a stage in evolution at all. should expect the evolution itself as a method of producing change will be superseded. And finally, I should not be surprised if, when the thing happened, very few people noticed that it was happening. Now, if you care to talk in these terms, the Christian view is precisely that the next step has already appeared. And it is really new. It is not a change from brainy men to brainier men. It is a change that goes off in a totally new direction. A change from being creatures of God to being sons of God. The first instance appeared in Palestine two thousand years ago. In a sense, the change is not evolution at all, because it is not something arising out of the natural process of events, but something coming into nature from outside. But that is what I should expect. We arrived at our idea of evolution from studying the past. If there are real novelties in store, then of course our idea, based on the past, will not really cover them. And in fact, this new step differs from all previous ones, not only in coming from outside nature, but in several other ways as well. 1. It is not carried on by sexual reproduction. Need we be surprised at that? There was a time before sex had appeared, development used to go on by different methods. Consequently, we might have expected that there would come a time when sex disappeared, or else, which is what has actually happened, a time when sex, though it continued to exist, ceased to be the main channel of development. 2. At the earlier stages, living organisms have had either no choice or very little choice about taking the new step. Progress was, in the main, something that happened to them, not something that they did. But the new step, the step from being creatures to being sons, is voluntary. At least, voluntary in one sense. It is not voluntary in the sense that we, of course, could have chosen to take it, or could even have imagined it. But it is voluntary in the sense that when it is offered to us, we can refuse it. We can, if we please, shrink back. We can dig in our heels and let the new humanity go on without us. 3. I have called Christ the first instance of the new man. But of course he is something much more than that. He is not merely a new man, one specimen of the species, but the new man. He is the origin and center and life of all the new men. He came into the created universe of his own will, bringing with him the Zoe, the new life. I mean new to us, of course. In its own place, Zoe has existed forever and ever. And he transmits it, not by heredity, but what I have called good infection. Everyone who gets it, gets it by personal contact with him. Other men become new by being in him. 4. This step is taken at a different speed from the previous ones. Compared with the development of man on this planet, the diffusion of Christianity over the human race seems to go on like a flash of lightning. For two thousand years is almost nothing in the history of the universe. Never forget that we are all still the early Christians. The present wicked and wasteful divisions between us are, let us hope, a disease of infancy. We are still teething. The outer world, no doubt, thinks just the opposite. It thinks we are dying of old age. But it has thought that so often before. Again and again it has thought Christianity was dying, dying by persecutions from without or corruptions from within, by the rise of Mohammedanism, the rise of the physical sciences, the rise of great anti-Christian revolutionary movements. But every time the world has been disappointed. Its first disappointment was over the crucifixion. The man came to life again. In a sense, and I quite realize how frightfully unfair it must seem to them, that has been happening ever since. They keep on killing the thing that he started. And each time, just as they are patting down the earth on its grave, they suddenly hear that it is still alive, and has even broken out in some new place. No wonder they hate us. 5. The stakes are higher. 
By falling back at the earlier steps, a creature lost, at the worst, its few years of life on this earth. Very often it did not lose even that. By falling back at this step, we lose a prize which is, in the strictest sense of the word, infinite. For now the critical moment has arrived. Century by century, God has guided nature up to the point of producing creatures which can, if they will, be taken right out of nature, turned into gods. Will they allow themselves to be taken? In a way it is like the crisis of birth. Until we rise and follow Christ, we are still parts of nature, still in the womb of our great mother. Her pregnancy has been long and painful and anxious, but it has reached its climax. The great moment has come. Everything is ready. The doctor has arrived. Will the birth go off all right? But of course it differs from an ordinary birth in one important respect. In an ordinary birth, the baby has not much choice. Here it has. I wonder what an ordinary baby would do if it had the choice. It might prefer to stay in the dark and warmth and safety of the womb. For of course it would think the womb meant safety. That would be just where it was wrong. For if it stays there, it will die. On this view, the thing has happened. The new step has been taken and is being taken. Already the new men are dotted here and there all over the earth. Some, as I have admitted, are still hardly recognizable. But others can be recognized. Every now and then one meets them. Their very voices and faces are different from ours, stronger, quieter, happier, more radiant. They begin where most of us leave off. They are, I say, recognizable. But you must know what to look for. They will not be very like the idea of religious people which you have formed from your general reading. They do not draw attention to themselves. You tend to think that you are being kind to them when they are really being kind to you. They love you more than other men do, but they need you less. We must get over wanting to be needed. In some goodish people, especially women, that is the hardest of all temptations to resist. They will usually seem to have a lot of time. You will wonder where it comes from. When you have recognized one of them, you will recognize the next one much more easily. And I strongly suspect, but how should I know, that they recognize one another immediately and infallibly across every barrier of color, sex, class, age, and even of creeds. In that way, to become holy is rather like joining a secret society. To put it at the very lowest, it must be fun. But you must not imagine that the new men are, in the ordinary sense, all alike. A good deal of what I have been saying in this last book might make you suppose that that was bound to be so. To become new men means losing what we now call ourselves. Out of ourselves into Christ we must go. His will is to become ours, and we are to think His thoughts, to have the mind of Christ, as the Bible says. And if Christ is one, and if He is thus to be in us all, shall we not be exactly the same? It certainly sounds like it, but in fact it is not so. It is difficult here to get a good illustration, because, of course, no other two things are related to each other, just as the Creator is related to one of His creatures. But I will try two very imperfect illustrations which may give a hint of the truth. Imagine a lot of people who have always lived in the dark. You come and try to describe to them what light is like. You might tell them that if they come into the light, that same light would fall on them all, and they would all reflect it, and thus become what we call visible. Is it not quite possible that they would imagine that, since they were all receiving the same light and all reacting to it in the same way, i.e. all reflecting it, they would all look alike? Whereas you and I know that the light will in fact bring out or show up how different they are. Or again, suppose a person who knew nothing about salt. You give him a pinch to taste and he experiences a particular strong, sharp taste. You then tell him that in your country people use salt in all their cookery. Might he not reply, in that case, I suppose all your dishes taste exactly the same, because the taste of that stuff you have just given me is so strong that it will kill the taste of everything else. But you and I know that the real effect of salt is exactly the opposite. So far from killing the taste of the egg and the tripe and the cabbage, it actually brings it out. They do not show their real taste till you have added the salt. Of course, as I warned you, this is not really a very good illustration, because you can, after all, kill the other tastes by putting in too much salt, whereas you cannot kill the taste of a human personality by putting in too much Christ. I am doing the best I can. It is something like that with Christ and us. The more we get what we now call ourselves out of the way and let Him take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. 
There is so much of him that millions and millions of little Christs, all different, will still be too few to express him fully. He made them all. He invented, as an author invents characters in a novel, all the different men that you and I were intended to be. In that sense, our real selves are all waiting for us in him. It is no good trying to be myself without him. The more I resist him and try to live on my own, the more I become dominated by my own heredity and upbringing and surroundings and natural desires. In fact, what I so proudly call myself becomes merely the meeting place for trains of events which I never started and which I cannot stop. What I call my wishes become merely the desires thrown up by my physical organism or pumped into me by other men's thoughts or even suggested to me by devils. Eggs and alcohol and a good night's sleep will be the real origins of what I flatter myself by regarding as my own highly personal and discriminating decision to make love to the girl opposite me in the railway carriage. Propaganda will be the real origin of what I regard as my own personal political ideals. I am not, in my natural state, nearly so much of a person as I like to believe. Most of what I call me can be very easily explained. It is when I turn to Christ, when I give myself up to his personality, that I first begin to have a real personality of my own. At the beginning I said there were personalities in God. I will go further now. There are no real personalities anywhere else. Until you have given up yourself to him, you will not have a real self. Sameness is to be found most among the most natural men, not among those who surrender to Christ. How monotonously alike all the great tyrants and conquerors have been, how gloriously different are the saints. But there must be a real giving up of the self. You must throw it away blindly, so to speak. Christ will indeed give you a real personality, but you must not go to him for the sake of that. As long as your own personality is what you are bothering about, you are not going to him at all. The very first step is to try to forget about the self altogether. Your real, new self, which is Christ's and also yours, and yours just because it is his, will not come as long as you are looking for it. It will come when you are looking for him. Does that sound strange? The same principle holds, you know, for more everyday matters. Even in social life you will never make a good impression on other people until you stop thinking about what sort of impression you are making. Even in literature and art no man who bothers about originality will ever be original. Whereas if you simply try to tell the truth, without caring tuppence how often it has been told before, you will, nine times out of ten, become original without ever having noticed it. The principle runs through all life from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and the death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will ever be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him everything else thrown in. This concludes the reading of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. This book was read by Geoffrey Howard.